we stand, we sing the opening hymn, Thou whose almighty word. Good evening, everyone. It's so good to see all of you back again. Let us turn to page one of our liturgy book, or you can just proceed and see at the PowerPoint. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Please be seated. Together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with all men. We pray together. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, who have sinned against you and against our fellow men, in thought and word and deed, with negligence do this, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us all rise to say the Gloria. together. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, O God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. 
the collect of the day. Gracious Father, by the obedience of Jesus who brought salvation to our wayward world, draw us into harmony with your will that we may find all things restored in him, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Now we have the ministry of the word. The Old Testament reading is taken from Genesis chapter 24, verses 34 to 38, 42 to 49, and 58 to 67. Genesis 24, verse 34. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. And he has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female servants, and camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And to him he has given all that he has. Now my master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell. But you shall go to my father's house and to my family and take a wife for my son. Verse 42. And this day I came to the well and said, O Lord God of my father Abraham, of my master Abraham, if you will now prosper the way in which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin comes out to draw water, and I say to her, Please give me a little water from your pitcher to drink. And she says to me, Drink and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. But before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebekah coming out with a pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down to the well and drew water. And I said to her, please let me drink. And she made haste and let her pitcher down from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will give your camels a drink also. So I drank, and she gave the camels a drink also. Then I asked her and said, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the nose ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrists, and I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord, and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, who had led me in the way of truth to take the daughter of my master's brother for his son. Now, if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Verse 58. Then they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands, of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Then Rebekah and her maids rose, and they rode on the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. Now Isaac came from the land of Bir Lahai Roy, for he dwelt in the south. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. And he lifted his eyes and looked, and there the camels were coming. Then Rebekah lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel. For she had said to the servant, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The New Testament reading is taken from the books of Romans chapter 7, verse 15 to 25. Verse 15. 
For what, I, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. For, but what I had, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For, for two will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warrings against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gradual hymn. Oh, the gospel reading. Pardon, pardon me. Gospel reading this evening is taken according to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 11, verses 16 to 19, then verses 25 to 30. Glory to Christ, our Savior. Verse 11. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not lament. Verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and lean and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the gospel of Christ. Father, we turn our hearts to worship you, to listen to your word. Teach us to be still, to listen. Teach us to feed on your word. Nurture our hearts to hunger for you. Come and speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome each and every one of you back 
to this uh, service. We especially welcome back, uh, how should I put it, the evergreen or the greener, right? Uh, welcome you back. It's good to see uh, each and every one of you. Uh, I know many of you have been uh, away much longer than the 70 and below. Like uh, some of you, this is your first Sunday after many Sundays. Welcome back. Uh, why don't we turn to one another and says, good to see you, especially the ever, ever green. Right? It's good to see you. I'm going to preach on building strong relationship in family. The key word is relationship in family. We have looked at a number of uh, uh, topics, including strong and courageous, as, especially for father. Uh, last week, uh, Reverend Stephen spoke of uh, what does it mean to be, how do we please God? How do we please our parents? Meaning all of us who are children, old or young uh, child, we want to honour our parents. Now today, I want sort of to conclude it uh, by focusing on relationship. Uh, the importance of relationship in our family specifically. I'm going to ask you to watch this video clip. Is it ready? No, not quite ready yet. Okay. Uh, you put up your hand when you're ready, okay? Okay, otherwise I'm not sure. Now, I want to talk about relationship here. When I talk about relationship, what I mean, I do not just refer to parents, children. I, I, I want to say it is as broad as possible in a sense between husband and wife, children and parents, parents and children, between siblings, and of course, with our children. Uh, family is crucial. Now, let me ask this question. What does a strong family look like? What does a strong family look like in their relationship? Now, when, we, when I thought of that, I... It's, it takes a while to remember that. Because we have a tendency to remember the more negative part. Uh, generally, we remember that. It is true, we can tell what a weak family look like. What is not a strong family? What it would look like. Right? Uh, I'm going to come back to that. Let's just watch this video uh, and I'll come back to this point. Success 
is where there is relationship. Success is where there is relationship, especially in our family. Uh, where there is thanksgiving, where we leave good memories to the next generation, to our children, to our children's children. And what does it look like, therefore? We need to ask this. If we are to leave something behind, what would you leave behind? We, if we are to leave something good behind, something eternal even, there must be strong relationship in family. And when, of course, when we think of what it looks like, we think of what it does not look like. In fact, we, uh, in our daily reading, we are in the part of David and his family. This part of David's life is straight after David fell badly with sin of adultery and murder. What follows straight is the family story. And we read how complicated family can be and we can identify with them, maybe not to the same degree, but we read, we understand family is not straightforward. There are a lot of curves, a lot of ages, there are a lot of pain, a lot of difficulties, while a lot of joy, a lot of celebration, a lot of uh, peace, a lot of harmony. But in the midst, it is mixed. And we know the negative especially. We think of the pain, the hurts, sometimes the blaming, sometimes the shouting, sometimes the anger, sometimes the cold war. Family are important, yet they are not always as simple as we would wish it to be. So when, when I think of what a family should look like, there are biblical pictures of strong family. But, I want to sh but when I thought of that, I also thought of my wife's family. Uh, because, you know, often we talk about it. Uh, she, Karen tells me of her family. She tells me especially of a grandfather. A grandfather worked in a shipyard. Uh, and what is interesting, they look forward each day for the grandfather to come home. They all live in a small HDB flat, old HDB flat, and uh, I think about five or six children plus grandchildren, all in one flat. Uh, and and I, I don't know how they live, but that's how it was in Singapore then. And, and she added this, she, she, she often tells the story of the grandfather coming home, and he would do things with them, and he would bring home monkeys from the shipyard. Uh, and the next day, the monkey disappeared. How it happens is a mystery to her and obviously to us. And he will bring home strange animals, tortoise and so forth. And of course, durians, bags of durians. And it is interesting to hear that story. And why I say this is, to me, a good family in many ways. Not perfect, but a good family. Because they're much laughter. They watch TV together, they laugh together, they cry together. And what I am clearly impressed is even though the, the grandfather was not around, with the grandmother around then, they would often gather. Because in my early courtship years, I would be with them and I would see them gather together. Chinese New Year uh, often. Um, and then now the grandmother not around, uh, they would still gather at special occasion and they would still talk and I'm aware there had been pain in the family but they still could forgive and move forward together. That, I think, is a good example of a family that is strong in relationship. As Christians, as God's children, God called us to strong family to have relationship, we need to have a vision, a goal of what our family must be like. Let me share a few thoughts on how we can build family in strength, in relationship. This is not all, there are many others, but I want to share a few. But let me also say this, how to build one, it must include every member of the family, Meaning, if you are, you, you includes you, all of you here has a family, some in Brunei, some overseas, but still, there's a need to build and everyone must participate. 
And I want to add this, and it is never too late. Some of us, our family are broken. If we are honest, we do not need to mention about it. Some of us has uh, struggled, but nonetheless, it is never too late because God is a God of grace. God is a God of reconciliation, of redemption. Now, the first thing about building family in relationship is this, is invest intentionally and proactively in relationship. We need to be intentional. And the key word I want to use here is invest. Right? I want to quote this. It says, you don't just spend time with your family. You don't just spend time with your wife or your children or your parents. You invest. Every time you spend time with them, you are actually investing. Now, the idea of investing is this. Investing time means using one of the scariest resources. But there is a reward. The relationship so vital to spiritual mentoring uh, in the context of children, parent and children, increases in value. Invest is, we understand invest when we think of share, stocks, insurance. We, we, we put money into a certain uh, 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 shares or, or, or a business or, or uh, uh, insurance that you buy. You put money in, right? And that could be what you have. What do you expect from that? You expect a reward. When does the reward come? Often is after many years, then the reward come. That's the idea of investing. It is you put it in now, and every month and every year, you put a certain amount. You put it in, you, you keep putting it in systematically, intentionally, proactively. That is investment. You put it in, it could be for your child, it could be for yourself. At the end of it, you get a certain amount. Uh, not too long ago, I was approached by a, a close friend, a pastor's friend, saying, would you buy insurance? Well, he's not a full-time pastor. Uh, it, it says this is, this is uh, quite, this is not expensive. I think it's probably about... Uh, less than 10 or something like this. It's up to you. So I decide to took out whatever I have and I put it in. And it says after six years, you will get something. And true enough, after six years, I got an extra 2000 or $3,000. And I was quite happy with the investment. That's the idea of investment. You don't just give the money. You put it in, at the end, you get something out of it. It's the same with family. Every time you spend time, you're investing in that family. Every time you give, every time you speak a words of kindness, every time you take your parents out for a dinner or celebrate her birthday or his or, or your father of, on Father's Day, you're investing. Every time we spend time with our children, we're investing. We're not just spending time alone. And the values increase. We need to understand that. And we need to do it intentionally and proactively. If you want to retire with some money, you need to save, invest. Whether it is put into a fixed deposit so that at the end, you get something out of it. What must you do? You must plan. Today, the term Financial planning is very common. It's very common now. You must plan so that when you retire, you get something. You cannot depend on tap alone. There's no more uh, pension, if I'm correct about that, except for certain government uh, civil servants, right? So you need to invest so that at the end, you get something. It has to be intentional. That is what we must do with relationship in a family. How well do you invest? That's the question. How well do you invest? Now, often as parents, we want to invest into our children. How do we invest? Now, sometimes we try to invest into them what we did not receive, what we didn't get. So meaning, if I didn't get education, I didn't get this, I didn't get that, I want my children to have it. We want to compensate and so as a result, we give a lot of what we call experiential uh, uh, investment. 
Now, what it means experiential uh, investment is this. If I don't get piano class, if I don't know how to play piano, actually, I want to let you know a little secret. One of my dream is to be able to play some musical instrument, including piano. Uh, maybe it was a long dream, but I ever thought I would like to do that. And I, I, uh, I said, maybe I, if I can't get it, I'll find a girlfriend that can play the piano. But it didn't happen. So I make sure my children play. But of course, my children were happy to play. So what do we do? We invest experiential investment into their lives. But listen to this. Sometimes we try to compensate so much. We pour a lot of experiential investment. Piano, tuition, uh, karate, taekwondo, judo. Why we add in huge amount. We send them for uh, all sorts of events. Swimming, uh, as I mentioned two weeks ago, Chinese class. We invest so much of such thing into them. It's not wrong. They are good. But so much so, they are rich experientially. But poor relationally. Do you hear what I say? Rich experientially, but poor relationally. Meaning, they have so little time to spend time with us or we have so little time to spend time with them. As a result, there is little relationship or minimal. Now, think about that. Now, I want, therefore, bring in this passage of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to chapter 6, verse 4. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says this, submit to one another. And it says this, wife, submit to your husband. Husband, love your wife just as Christ loved his church. And then it goes on to say this, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in training and instruction of the Lord. Now, I want to say this. Now, here is two things you want to pick up. One is authority. The other one is relationship. Say with me, authority, relationship. Now, often when we read this Ephesians chapter 5, the first verse, it says, submit to your husband. What do we do? What does the woman, the wife do? They cringe. Wow. Why? Because it is, it has this idea of authority that husband is the authority. As wife, you must submit to your husband. Now, but I want you to take note of this. There is an element of authority. It is correct. But listen to the second verse. Husband, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What is that? It is relationship. It is relationship. If we just look at authority without the relationship, it is not balanced. Then that's where we will struggle. How come the Bible seems so sexist is the word. But understand this, that verse cannot be read alone, submit to your husband. It must be read with this, just as Christ loved the church. Meaning, if we are to have healthy marriage, there is a given authority, but there is, it must work within the context of love, relationship, molded after Jesus. Without this relationship, it will become almost like a master towards a slave, then the wife sees herself as like a doormat, a floor mat. But it's not. It must be in the context of relationship. Love. When there is that love and authority, the roles put together, then it makes sense. Then I can trust my husband because she or he loves me so much so that he is willing to die for me. Then it becomes and uh, uh, submitting to one another become easy. It must be in the context of relationship. Now with that, let me bring you to the parent-children relationship. The word here is, fathers, do not exasperate your children. What's the idea of exasperate? The idea of ex exasperate is basically make your children angry. Children, have you been angry with your parents, your father before? 
I can hear a silent yes to that. We all have experienced it, every one of us. Right? No matter how good our father or mothers are, we have experienced that, so we get angry. But sometimes there is, sometimes our anger is wrong, but sometimes there is a reason for that. It is this again. Is there a relationship or is it just authority? Now, how it translates into parent-children relationship is quite simple. When, now, think of this. When we were young, when, you, when your children were young, five, six years old, what do we say to them? We say, is, when we try to talk to them, uh, they want to do something. Says, no, daddy says so. And the child says, okay, daddy says so. I will go with that. And as they grow older, we say, no, I say, I'm your father. You just listen to me. It is authority. The size matter. I'm bigger than you. So listen to me. I am bigger, I'm smarter. In Chinese, we say, I eat more salt than you eat rice. Now, it makes sense when they are small. Okay, daddy, you're my hero. Go ahead, whatever you say is correct. True? Most of the time, right? Unless we really, really uh, push it too far. Now, what happened when they turn teenager? Do we do the same authority relationship? Which one is more? We still sometimes miss because we do not invest in relationships, we struggle. So when they become teenager, we say this: Ah, you don't obey me, huh? Eh? I don't give you pocket money. And they say, okay, okay, okay. Father, you are bigger because your pocket is deeper. I don't have, I rely on you. Okay, whatever you say. And of course, we say, if you are, if you are good with your exam, I give you a handphone. Wow, lagi siok. iPhone lagi bagus. So, it is the size, the authority. Not so much of relationship. And when crisis hit, we bang the table. We say, listen to me. If you don't obey me, I will give you pocket money. What happened then? It is where rules is put in place without relationship. What happened? Rules without relationship. What happened? Rebellion in the heart. Silently, we, we become angry. Yeah, okay. I'll just go with you because you're my father. You're my mother. you got the money. I, I depend on you. Uh, otherwise, you won't drive me to my friend's house. So we sometimes go along with it. But in all this, realize this, slowly we're eroding relationship with our children. You get what I mean? Now, push this a bit further. They become young adult. What happened? We, if we have no relationship, if it's still experiential without relationship, what do we do? We say to our children when they're young adults, you obey me. If not, you don't get the car key. If you don't obey me, you go and study on your own. Lah. You pay yourself. Lah. Wow. Tialat. So of course, what do the children do? Okay, I obey you now. But once they get a chance, they will step out. They say goodbye. Why? Because there is no relationship. What glues family together cannot be the size and the authority Maybe when they were younger, there's a need for more of that because it's difficult to explain certain things. Just, just listen to daddy. That's fine. There's a place for that. But as our children grow, relationship must be put in place. It must keep growing. We must invest intentionally. If we don't invest properly, you'll find at the end of it, they'll say, bye, you're on your own. I'm on my own. I don't need to depend on you anymore. By then... The size does not matter anymore. By then, they are as big as us, as authoritative as us. It says, I don't need you anymore. So listen to me on this. Do not exasperate your children. That's one way we often do not realize. We say, ha, just listen to me. Because the money is with me. Because a car is with me. And so as a result, our children become angry quietly. Do not do that as parents, as fathers especially, but rather bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord, meaning love them. Bring the word of God. Again, you cannot bring the word of God into their life if there's no relationship. You cannot preach to them and say, listen to me. This is what the Bible says. 
turn away from your sin. If there's no relationship, your influence diminishes. Diminishes. Remember, at the end of the day, we want to influence our children. Even when they are parents themselves, we want to be able to influence them in a sense that we are their friend. They will turn to us for counsel in difficult times. But it's always in a context where there is relationship. So invest correctly, not just the experiential, let them not just be experientially rich, but more important, relationally rich with you, with one another as a family. Take time to be together. Right? So with that, let me say this. We must begin with the most basic relationship. And the most basic relationship is first and foremost, our relationship with God. Second, as a child, those who are young people here, with your parents. Do not resist your parents, but rather build relationship with your parents too. With siblings, love one another. Work together. With spouse, let me say this. How does marriage work? You keep falling in love. That's with the same woman for the next 30, 40, 50 years. Same woman, same, keep falling in love. That's what we must invest in. And of course, with our children or those who are grandparents, with your grandchildren. Now let me then move to this. The first is we must invest correctly, right? The second is this, we must have fun time. Family must have fun together. It says good times give strength to face the hard times that relationship is bound to bring. In every family, there will be challenges. What would hold us through? Of course, we need God. A part of what God calls us to is to have fun together. Parents, where there is fun, parents are not just disciplinarian, but you are, to your children, interested in many aspects of his or her life. Not just his or her behavior or results or performance. When we stop playing with them, when we say, it's not, I don't want to play with you. We're saying, and we only concentrate on their behavior. This is wrong. This is poor. Your result is poor. Our children see that we're only interested in an, only an aspect of their life. We need to play together. We need to have fun together. And how do we have fun together? We need to know our families. We do not just play or have fun on the basis of what we are interested, but rather what? Our family, our spouse, our parents, our children, our siblings are interested. All right? So we do that. Right, here's a picture of a, of a grandfather with a grandson playing chess. I like that idea. Now, I ask a number of church members, what do you do to have family fun time? And these are some of them. It says play time. Play time, not just play together. Uh, just go out and play together. All right? uh, and and this, this father says, I would, I would uh, uh, have 20 minutes in the morning, play with my young son, uh, my, my uh, uh, two years old son, play with him, have fun together. And I think that's important, right? And of course, uh, he also says park day, meaning go to the park, play on a swing on Sunday. And the most common, the most uh, repeated one is meal together. And guess which, whether it was the man or the woman said this. The woman says this. The woman says meal time is the best because we get to chit chat, we're going to share memory, we talk about everything. Our family come back, we talk, we talk, we talk, we chit chat after dinner. We have we have ice cream, we have dessert, uh, but not so many men says that. I understand because men are not so good at talking, right? Some are good, but most are okay, but not great. Uh, to have good meal with a lot of chit chat together, you need women in there. I find if you put all the men together, they look at one another, they say, I don't know what to talk about. Let's go watch soccer. That's why you find uh, soccer time. Watch soccer on TV. That's more attractive for men, right? And I think you agree with me. Of course, ice cream time. Uh, someone says, a family get together. Chinese New Year, Christmas, where you have board game, play game together. They say, that is one of the most special moments in our family time, right? And uh, barbecue, of course, is 
prominent among men. Why? It's also meal time, but the men cannot just have meal. They need to have things to do. They want to start the fire. They want to burn the chicken you know, and, and so forth, or set things on fire. Somehow men has this wild side to them. And it's good to, 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 to do that, right? And so, example of fun time. Of course, family holidays, holiday trips uh, to KK, to Miri, overseas, to Bangkok. Uh, someone added this, you know, holiday where we have, uh, we, we remember one another bucket list. You know what's bucket list? I, I want to buy this. I want to go that place. That's the bucket list, the wish list kind of things. All right, celebration, birthdays, dinner out, celebrating birthday too, sometimes, or sometimes special night out. Game time or board game night. This is one of the uh, highlight. Uh, one of our church members even give the name of the game. He says, uh, dance, the dance. I'm like, what game is that? He's obviously older, much older. He's uh, first time in this survey. He says, dance the dance. Uh, keep a straight face. Draw the object. I thought, what game is it? I read, okay, all right. right uh, draw the object is like uh, win, lose, and draw in our content. But, you know, that's fun together. A day trip out. Today, uh, one of the most common day trip out is to go Temburong because you cannot go Miri, right? So go Temburong on the bridge. Whoa, so nice. Uh, we all, all on Instagram, Facebook, the bridge. Same one, all look the same. Because you cannot get out. You just take the same. The only difference is how good your camera is, right? That's what happened. But it's still fun. I've been to Temburong twice already, right? Uh, uh, each time, it still amazes me. Hopefully, I don't get bored of that, right? Uh, now, and then, of course, beach picnic, right? Uh, I remember beach picnic with my family, and there was some horrific story, you know, but uh, I won't mention that. Road trip, uh, tell stories and memories. Those were amazing. Uh, I, and I and, and think these are all important right, where we take time. Uh, someone said, during this COVID-19, because we cannot go anywhere, I, I would get to cycle with my son and daughter outside the house almost every day. Right, it, says, it was good, scooter time. Uh, another family during this COVID-19, in fact, more than one family said this. It says, we followed the online service. And one family said this, not just online service. After that, my children, because this, this family is musically inclined, all of them can play. They would worship God together, play guitar, piano, drum. I'm like, wow, I wish I can play the guitar now, which I... I've given up more or less, right? But, but that's how family do. Of course, during this COVID-19, hiking has become very popular. What, uh, uh, they have Bukit Sipatil, Bukit Patio, or whatever in Temburong. So, and I have a youth that came up with a list of 30 Bukit. They said, we're going to conquer. They have checklists even. Like, wow, so many. Some of them in Tutong, KB, they want to go and climb. Oh, very good. Go ahead, I said. Bless you. Right? Uh, right? And of course, another family says a uh, yearly trip to KK. Another family, another sister said this. We do project like painting and then we display them in our house. Now, when I asked my daughter this morning, I have my one-to-one -one time with my daughter. If you wonder why I say this, it's because my daughter is not in Brunei, by the way. Some of you say, huh? huh? What happened? Before Easter, we quickly flew her out because she's supposed to start uh, poly. So she's in Singapore. So I had a one-to-one -one time with her. So I asked her this question. Can you tell me three things you will remember in our family fun time? And she said this. The first is treasure hunt. Treasure hunt. I used to do treasure hunt as a family devotion. He said, I remembered it because it's not just the fun of the treasure hunt. It's at the end of the treasure hunt, there's always a gift. And my daughter loved books. So at the end of the treasure hunt, someone who leads to, oh, there's a treasure, a book. She opened it with joy. So she remembers it. Family fun time. And she says the second one is uh, the beach. Uh, how many of you know that at Crocodile Beach, at the end of it, there's a river? Some of you know that, right? And she remembered it specifically, swimming in the river. The three of us. Son, daughter, and father. She remembered that. The third thing she remembered is this. Movies. Movie night, where we go cinema. She enjoys that. Now, one I if you ask me, with my children, what do I remember? There's one that I remember. There was one time we went to uh, a, a farm. I drove my car up onto the hill. It gets dark. 
we start a fire. Don't tell the owner, okay? I won't tell you who the owner is. We started a fire. We have our pan, cooking pan, and we cook instant noodle there. We had a great night, but it was so hot, I took off my shirt, so I won't show you the, vi- the, the, the photo. I have no shirt on, I was sweating, but we were cooking instant noodle on the pot, and we ate instant noodle. It was our semi-camping. We didn't want to do camping, it was too crazy, so we do semi-camping. We finish off probably about 11.30 and drive home, so sleep at home. But semi-camping, instant noodle in the jungle, that's about it. But the instant noodle was extra good, because it has extra ingredients. I won't tell you what it is, right? <laughs> no, just joking. Just joking, okay? Now, that will scare you off now, right? So, that's this, we must have family fun time and family remembers it. I'm quite sure if I will ask you here, what do you remember of your family? All of you will have something to remember. Wow, we did that. Chinese New Year, uh, Christmas, we go church together. We, uh, Chinese New Year, we gather. Uh, we play fireworks. Uh, we, uh, we, we do all sorts of things with our siblings, with our parents, It is truly special moments, right? So when we have fun time, it build, it it contributes to the foundations of relationship. Now let me move on. The third is this. The first is invest. The second is fun time. The third is appreciate and encourage one another. If I would ask you to remember a family member right now, could you do that just in your head? Who do you think of? Right. The next thing I want you to ask you to do is, can you remember three things, good things about this person? Three good things about this person that you would say to him or her. How many of you have got the answer now? Put up your hand, don't be shy. Only one, two only. The rest of you got no answer. Alamak, cannot remember the good things about your wife, your son, your daughter, your father, your grandfather? You're in trouble, man. All of you need counselling. Reverend Stephen, please take care of them. Okay? Now, now, we need to appreciate. Now, I, I will be honest with you and I agree with you. I remember people. Sometimes I tend to remember the bad side, the negative side, the things he said, the things he hurts me. But if I remember carefully, I begin to remember the good things of this person the loyalty, the help. What else do we remember? The growing up together where he or she took care of me. Can we remember them? Now, let me say this. For a family to be strong in relationship, there must be appreciation. If we do not appreciate one another, we would never, never value one another. But the truth is, all of us have been hurt. We cannot remember some of these good things. But we must practice remembering. We must practice remembering good things about people, appreciate them, and when we practice it, it becomes permanent. It becomes permanent. Parents, remember the good things about your children. Stop comparing. Sometimes we say, Aya, how good is your son? Aya, he, he's not like the other boy. He's not like the other girl. We compare. And, we com- and then we say, how good is your wife? Aya, that, 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 that fellow's wife is so much better, so prettier, so much more understanding. My wife screamed at me, cook lousy, that, this, that. We remember all the negative things. But would we stop complaining, comparing? Would we learn to give thanks. Because in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, it says this, whatever you do, what you say, what you eat, how you relate, do it all in the name of Christ. Giving thanks to God the Father. Remember. Remember. Learn to give thanks. You can only give thanks if you appreciate. You can only give thanks when you remember what the person has done, who he is, the strength of that person. We must key in, tune up the strength, the positive of a person. We must tune down the negative 
But if we are honest, we are very good at tuning up the negative. I remember that bad about him or her. He hurt me. We tune it up. We remember it so clearly. But we tune down the positive. Can I suggest this? If you would really write it down, you will find often the good is so much more. But we cannot remember because we focus on the negative. As long as you fix your eyes on the negative, you have no room for the positive. We must learn to remember, tune up the positive and make it an encouragement. It says everyone wants to be appreciated. So if you appreciate someone, don't keep it a secret. Don't. Say to your wife, you're so beautiful. Still so beautiful. Say to your husband, ah, you're so loyal. So good to have you. You, you take care of us. Ah, the light bulb, I cannot change. You change. Come on. Encourage them. Though you can do it, come on, keep quiet. Your husband, you are so good at it. Encourage them. Of course, I know. Uh, uh, I, uh, tell them good things. Encourage them. Tell your wife good things. Tell your children good things. Learn to spot good things. Train your eyes, your ears to see good things about your children. They've done something good. Pick it up. Journal them. Tell them what's happening, say, son or daughter. Wow, that was a good job. Wow, that was very responsible of you. Wow, you, you, you saw this. I didn't see it. Encourage them. Encourage them. But of course, be honest. Don't, don't, don't what you call saka or uh, give false uh, uh, story, of course. It has to be real. Learn to spot them so that we learn to appreciate and encourage. Remember, appreciation and encouragement is like oxygen. Have you ever felt breathless, no air? Have you been into a room where it's airtight, no, no windows, no aircon, it's stuffy? Have you been in there? Where there's no appreciation, no encouragement, it is like that. It is a terrible place to be in. Let there be full of appreciation, encouragement in our family. When that happens, family will be strong. The fourth is this, be attentive to the Heavenly Father. By this I mean, you remember I said two weeks ago, to be strong and courageous, you must be a son or a daughter to God, the Heavenly Father. I want to repeat that again. Be attentive to the Heavenly Father. It says, keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it, then you, you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I want to apply this to family. We must take the word of God. Listen attentively. Apply it. Meditate on the word of God day and night. And you'll find success in your family. There will be relationship. Create. When we meditate on the Word of God, it comes with prayer. When these two go hand in hand, we listen, we talk to God, we meditate. What do we do? We create room for God. Where there is no Word of God, where there's no prayer, we say to God, I don't need you. There's no room in my life for you. Not my family, especially. Please stay out. How many of us include God in our family? When we have challenges, do we say, God, what do you say? Do we? Sometimes we don't. Unintentionally, we don't sometimes. Because we don't, we fail to pray. We fail to look at the word and say, it speaks to my family. It speaks to me uh, as a father, as a man, as a brother, as a son. It speaks to me. When we learn to pray, meditate on the Word of God, we do not just know the Word of God. We know the author of the Word of God. That's why it says, meditate on the Word of God day and night. Do not turn from it to the left or to the right. At the end, what happens? It says, God will be with you. Why? Because when you think, when you apply the Word of God, when you keep it in your family, in every part of your life, this happens. You do not just know the Scripture. You know God 
as your heavenly father. It is interesting. Sometimes we don't think of God's word when it comes to family. And the most common promise in the Bible is this, fear not for I am with you. Am I correct about that? It is probably 300 over times. Just this promise, fear not for I am with you. Now, can I ask you this question? When did you feel fear the most? When did you feel fear the most? When did you panic the most? If you are honest, if I'm honest, it is when something happened to my family. That's where we become uptight, we get stressed up. When bad things happen to our family, when there's sickness, when there's pain, when there's fight in a family, when, when things happen in our family, we, we become more stressed up, most fearful. And yet, we don't always include God. Why? We must invite God. We must create room to let God journey with us, lead us in our most fearful moment. Parents, hear that. As parents, we know when something happened to our children and that's the worst thing that can happen often to us. That's the heart of parents. So, because fear is often related to family. Now again, as we meditate on the Word of God, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to give another example of how the Word of God, if we learn to meditate on it, it will change the way we see things. We must, one of them is to teach trust. It's interesting when we teach trust, we also teach distrust, faithlessness. Hear me correct. I didn't say faithfulness. I said faithlessness. Why? This is an example. We say this to our children again and again and again. There is a place for this. But we say it so often. This is what we say. If you don't get do well for your study, you don't do well for your O level, huh? You never go to university, you have no degree, you have no future. How many of you have never said that? Right? We say this so often. Now, I, I know that is, we, I'm not suggesting we don't talk, stress on the importance of studies. Studies is important. Young people, listen to me, it is important. Right? But parents, we must balance it. We cannot just keep saying this over and over again because when they hear this, what do they hear? All right? My life is dependent on education alone. Where is God in the picture? Doesn't it say God has a plan and a future and a hope for me? Where is God? No, my parents don't talk about it. Ah, you don't study, ah, you fail all level, you don't, you don't get melee credit, you're a gone case. We hear that. We hear that all the time. We need to balance it. There's a that we must stress the importance of education. But above all, we must be able to say, this, God will take care of your future. God, we can trust Him. Learn to meditate on the Word of God. Applied it to parenting. And the Word of God, when we meditate on it day and night, it becomes a compass to us. The idea of compass is you are lost. You're in a jungle. How do you get out? You need a compass. And compass is the idea of difficulties in family. What do I do in times of difficulties? I want to point you to the story of David in the last few days. The story of David, when... David sinned against God. One thing happened. David was absent. Say with me, absent. Say with me, absent. Right, thank you. You're not, you're not falling asleep, right? Now, the idea of absent, when God is absent in our life, or rather we are absent towards God, God is always present, but we are absent. God says, put up your hand. Johnny, where are you? Oh, no, no, no hands up. That's absent. David was absent. When David was absent to God, sin charged into his life. He has forgotten God, has put God aside, he's comfortable. Sin shouted. Sin took the best of him. Then, what follows after that? Interestingly, is a son raped the half-sister. 
And after that, is the son, the brother of Tamar, took justice into his hand, killed the brother, Edmond. I hope I remember correctly, right? Rape, murder, all took place. Next story is this, is rebellion. The son Absalom, for a period of time, was left in exile. He longed for the father to receive him back. The father, David, ignored him, left him in exile. Finally came back, David accepted him back, and it's all because the, uh, uh, the, the general got him back, not because of David. And when he got back, uh, reconciled, but in his heart, Absalom was a different man by then. So two things happened. The first is the exile, the f- the s- the, but the second is the exile. The first was the injustice n- that David gave. Remember, I said this, injustice David gave. When the s- sister was raped, David was silent. The only thing he did, the Bible tells us, he was very angry. Full stop, period. And that's it. Nothing done. There was no justice. There was no discipline. It's not an easy one. What, do, what would he, should he do? I don't have an answer, but there must be justice. But he was silent. As a result, the son, anger grew. Hatred grew. Murderous spirit grew. He finally killed the, uh, the, the son, uh, the brother. And then, of course, the exile, and then the rebellion. Now, in all this, can I just say this? If I read it correctly, David was again absent to God. There was very minimal suggestion that David turned to God. Why? Probably has to do with the first part. Probably he was still struggling with guilt when you are no longer in the presence of God. You can't give the justice because there's no word of God anymore. There's no guidance. There's no compass. What I do in such a painful time of my family when the whole family were breaking apart, where a, a son raped a daughter, what do you do? You have no compass because there's no attentiveness to God. Everything's fall apart. The families fall apart. There must be God in our family. We must have room for God. There must be the word of God that we think about it. We correspond it with our, our struggle in our family, our family situation. What is God saying? And often God says, forget your family mistake. Forget your wife, your husband mistake. Forget your son, your daughter's mistake. Because forgetting your family mistake is one of the greatest gifts you can give to him or her. It is. When I say forget, I don't mean, oh, suddenly you don't remember, you erase. No, it is choosing not to remember and record it. Ah, you did that, you did that, you did that. After 10 years, still the same thing. You did that, you did that to me. No, we must learn to put it aside. Learn to forgive. Here I put a picture of garbage in a house. You know garbage, if you keep in a house, what would happen? It would become stink. It would stink your house. All right? Picture this with me. Have you ever eaten prawn? The, everything after you put it in a dustbin? If you don't throw it away in two days, what happened? It stinks your whole kitchen. But try keeping it for five days. One week, what do you get? What do you get? Now have you done that? You get maggots in your dustbin. And it stinks the house. What are we supposed to do with garbage? Throw it out. Bring it to the dustbin. Dispose it, whether you get a truck, uh, the rubbish collector to collect it, or you bring it to the uh, uh, dumpster, uh, dumpster, you call it, and throw away your rubbish. If not, it will stink the whole place. But there are many garbage in our family. It's supposed to be thrown away every day, if not every two days. Anger, disappointment, discouragement, pain, wrong things done, they're all garbage. What do you do with them? Tie it up in a rubbish bag, throw it out. Don't keep it in a house. 
If you keep in a house for too long, it will destroy your house. David kept the rubbish, the garbage in the house for a long time. The injustice, the silence towards the son, the unforgiveness. He abdicated justice. He says, I'm not going to do anything. He left it to the son to exercise justice. All those were garbage. In times to come, the house become so bad condition that the son, Absalom, would rebel, would try even to kill him. Do not leave garbage in a house. Resolve them. Learn to forgive. Learn to forget. Learn to put it inside and say, it is okay. This is a family that learn. If there's a need, talk about it, confront it in a positive way. Pray through it, reconcile, forgive one another, accept one another. Learn to do that. With this, let me conclude. Invest the fun time. Appreciate and encourage. And lastly, be attentive to the Heavenly Father. Let me lead you in prayer. And as we pray, I want you just to close your eyes as we just remember our family. I want to ask you just to think about the last point, the garbage in your family. Are they garbage that needs to be removed? Forgiveness, healing, reconciliation need to take place. Would you ask God into your family again? But that step must begin with this, that you would ask Jesus into your life. You bring His Word into your life. You invite the Holy Spirit into your life again to bring the healing first to you, that you be attentive to Him again. There are probably a lot of hurts that God healed, and that can only take place if we open our hearts let God be in our lives. Would you do that this evening? Do not just ignore those pain or those brokenness. Bring it to God. And say, God, would you work in me first of all? So that there may be healing in my family. Let me do my part. Let me be faithful first to you. Let me be present to you again. Father, we bring families to you. As we bring families to you, we bring ourselves to you again. Help us, bring us to the place of knowing you. That we are your sons and your daughters and it will not just be any kind of sons or daughters, but we will be the kind that listen, that are attentive to you, the Heavenly Father, that will meditate on your word day and night, that we would have room in our hearts for you, and we would walk with you. Where there are pain, we we'll let you heal, so that we can build a family, whether we are sons or daughters or parents or siblings, or in-laws, or grandparents, may we bring a memories that is good, that the day when we leave this world, when we step out of the train, we will have brought good memories to our family. We will have built our family strong, that we have given fun time, we would have invested well. And we would have been grateful for each and every of our family members, our spouse, our parents, our children, our siblings. May we be so, God. May we learn to be in your presence, meditating on your word day and night, obeying it. 
and seeing your success, your strength in relationship in our families. Thank you. Work in my hearts. Begin with me. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. We stand for the Nicene Creed. We say together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternal begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us men and our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Again, we want to appreciate Reverend Johnny for the wonderful message. Let's give him an appreciation for this message. We move to our notices. Again, uh, we welcome you back to St. Andrew's Church. It's good to see the house of God, St. Andrew's Church, filled with so many faces, familiar faces. I know you miss gathering together, and we miss you as well. So here we are, and with that, um, thank you for coming this evening. We go into our notice, our heartfelt condolences to the family of Reverend Matthew Ubun, who passed away on the 2nd of July, 2020. He was also our vicar uh, in 1979 till 1984. I believe some of you will remember him. Do take note as well that the Sunday services, uh, we will be entering into the third phase according to MOH directive. So what is, that means is that we will be looking towards reverting to our Sunday slots, our Sunday services. Hopefully by next week, we will resume our Sunday services. That means this service will, um, will be on Sunday morning, Okay. Um, but we will be running at 80% capacity, which means 80% capacity of the full um, number of people at full house. All right, moving on. Do join us for our Tuesday prayer room. We will be meeting together on the 7th of July at 6 p.m. Come and join us as we intercede and pray for our church, our nation, for our leaders. St. Andrew's School will be recruiting for... The month of September, they're looking for cleaners. They're also looking for secondary BAT teacher. So if you have the skills or the training, please do consider applying for this role in the school. Also in January, there's an opening for three um, slots or three openings. Um, upper primary mathematics come science teacher. Upper primary MI become art teacher as well. Secondary English literature teacher. You can find more details on the... Um, Facebook account, St. Andrew's School Facebook account, or you may contact the school directly. And lastly, do bring your own face mask when you attend our services. We are running out of supply, so kindly do pay attention to this um, requirement as you attend the service. With that, we would like to turn to the Lord in prayer. We invite Dawn to lead us in intercession. Let us bow our heads and pray. Let us pray for the church and for the world and thank God for his goodness. We thank you, Lord, that we can come together to worship you. We thank you for all our pastors and all in the service of Christ for all they do to make it possible for us to worship and to grow in our walk with you. We pray for your grace, your protection, 
wisdom, blessings, and joy upon their lives as they love and serve you. Lord, in your mercy, let us pray for some of the South Asian countries, for Nepal, India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Jesus, we thank you for your faithfulness in how you have guided and equipped people in their livelihoods and have provided in the past. We bring before your throne of grace all those whose livelihood is affected and facing little or no income to provide food and shelter for themselves and their families. We lift up the migrant workers working far away from their families in order to provide for them. Father God, for those whose jobs are affected and not able to send funds back to their families who are dependent on their remittances and who are feeling helpless and in despair of the COVID-19 situation. Father, we pray you bring them comfort and peace and provide for them and their families in their times of need. We pray for the poor and vulnerable in these countries. Lord, protect and preserve those who are poor in health, those who suffer from hunger, not knowing where their next meal will come from, those who are homeless in all their sufferings. We pray that churches and Christian aid agencies will be able to minister to them, to share God's comfort and love, and to meet their needs. We pray for covering and protection upon the pastors, churches, and ministry workers as they share the message of hope in Christ. And we pray may these efforts be fruitful. We pray for all believers to remain steadfast in their faith, growing stronger, prayerfully, and to be dependent on you, God. Pour out your wisdom upon the leaders of these nations that they may have the strength, wisdom, compassion, and guide their decisions in managing the pandemic situation. Lord, in your mercy, let us pray for those who are unable to come to church to worship. For the elderly, for those who have health concerns, who are sick, those who are unable to come for different reasons. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your disciples, I am with you always. Indeed, Lord, we pray for your loving presence to be with them, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love. Keep them in your care. May they continue to worship you wherever they may be. May their relationship with you continue to grow and connect them with people who can encourage them and support them in their spiritual walk. May your grace be sufficient them always. Lord, in your mercy, let us pray for all who have returned from overseas and undergoing quarantine. We pray you help them to make good use of the time they have in the things they can do to take care of themselves mentally, physically, socially, emotionally, and spiritually. May they stay positive in their time of isolation. As your word says in Philippians 4.8, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Lord, in your mercy, Rejoicing in the fellowship of St. Andrews and all your saints, 
we commend ourselves and the whole creation to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray together. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean, our hearts were unprepared. Your feet comes from under your table. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation and share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and the blood of your Son, that he may live in us and we in him, and that we with the whole company of Christ may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen. We stand for the peace. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. Peace be with you. We remain standing as we sing our offer to him. I heard the voice of Jesus say.
be. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. The Lord is here. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to our Lord, our God. It is indeed right, it is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. For he is your living word. Through him, you have created all things from the beginning and form us in your own image. Through him, you have freed us from the slavery of sin, for give, giving him to be born as man and to die upon the cross. You raised him from the dead and exalted him on, to your right hand on high. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people for your own possession. And now we give you thanks because you are the source of light and life. You made us in your, in your image and called us to a new life in him. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Please be seated. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and as we follow his example and obey his command, Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. Who in the same night that he was betrayed, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup. He gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself, made once for all upon the cross, and proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. And as we look for his coming in glory, we celebrate with this bread and this cup, this one perfect sacrifice. Except through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise, and as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, by the power of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise, blessing and honor and glory and power, be yours forever and ever. Amen. As our Savior taught us, so we pray. this bread we share in the body of Christ. Lamb 
of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Brothers and sisters in Christ, draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Following the instructions from last week, when we hand out the holy sacred bread, bread, you take it from our fingers.
say the post-communion prayer together. Eternal God, comfort of the conflicted and the healer of the broken. You have fed us at the table of life and hope. Teach us the ways of gentleness and peace, that all the world may acknowledge the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the gates of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring his life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so that so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Together, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out to live peace and glory. Amen. The peace of God which passes through all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. We stand for the closing hymn. Send forth by God's blessing. Father, we give you thanks that we can come and you are with us. And we go from here in your presence. Where your presence is, there is your peace, your love, your joy and hope and your protection. Grant us a good night. Keep us in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.